I'm also the co-chair of one of the groups. Um, and we're really, really excited to have you here. This is going to be, just so you know, the last seminar of the spring. So, yep, we'll be ramping up, hopefully getting some events in the summer going on, some networking events in the summer. Um, so definitely stay posted and, and make sure to follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, we also have a website, so we'll be putting up new events there. Um, so today we're going to focus on entrepreneurship and alternative career paths. I'm just curious, how many of you, raise your hand if you have like a little side hustle. Cool, that's a lot. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. Um, you know, nowadays with how expensive everything is, especially in Boston, um, it, it's kind of detrimental now to kind of have a, a second alternative, uh, I guess, way of making some income. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on today. A bachelor's degree in communication from the University of Rhode Island and a master of education from the University of South Florida. Ama is the author of three books. The Eyes Have It, Reflections on Introversion and Student Affairs, Light It Up, Engaging the Introverted Student Leader, and Cultivating Creativity. Ama is a dynamic and sought-after speaker on topics such as leadership, group dynamics, creativity, and incorporating your values into your work and your larger goals. She speaks on college and university campuses across the country, has partnered with organizations like TEDx, HubSpot, Wayfair, Ovia Health, and General Assembly. And she is an outspoken advocate for creativity and believes strongly in the power of humor and looks forward to helping you find the way you live and work best. So please give a round of applause for Ama Marco. The life that you're pivoting to. So maybe you are thinking about the possibility of starting a product on the side and aren't really sure how to get there. Maybe you're in one career right now but feel like you need to be doing something different and you don't know what that is yet. Or maybe you have a target in sight and aren't really sure how to get there. I'm hoping that no matter which fits your circumstances, by the end of our time together, you'll have an idea of how to start moving in that direction. In one of the last years that I was on campus, um, I was asked to lead the procession along with one of our other associate deans of all the students coming in. And the first year I did it, it was fine. Um, and the person before me had been our director of multicultural affairs, also a black woman. And I think in the time between the first time I did it and the second time I did it, I started to make connections about why it was me that got asked. Mm -hmm. And I decided to just test something out. I said I, I didn't really enjoy doing that position. There were other parts of commencement that I would prefer to be a part of because I got to be around the students and connect with their families. And based on who I was, that made more sense for what I would like to do. And I said, if I decide not to do it, who will get picked? And I had a guess. Our current director of multicultural programs, who is black male, of all the people on campus, I said, if I don't do it, he's going to be the person to get asked. Didn't tell anybody, just kind of held that in my head. Once I turned it down, sure enough, it ended up being Jeff, so I was right. So the idea of it looking good to have that person up at the front or in a certain position versus the amount of impact you get to have where it might make a bigger difference, mm -hmm. that's been a reason why people. Mm -hmm. And I, that definitely contributed to my uh, decision to leave that particular role. Um, and then one of the last ones that I want to make sure that we talk about is being labeled as problematic or disruptive mm -hmm. rather than dissatisfied or even more. So recognizing that a lot of organizations are working within an environment where they need to shift for any number of reasons. Just the world that we're in, the environment we're living in, they need to move forward. And a lot of employees recognize that that move needs to happen, but their leaders don't. How are you treated when you bring up some of those things that might need to shift based on demographic changes, technology changes, anything that might recognize your business needs to move in a different direction? How are you greeted when you bring up those questions or objections or ideas? Sometimes they're received really well, but sometimes they're not. And how those things that aren't framed well are greeted affects your satisfaction in the job. So all of these things can contribute to the possibility of why you might say, this isn't the place I want to be in. Around the move that you're making and what you value, it keeps you from doing that thing where you just run from one place to another without really understanding why you're going or where. Mm -hmm. And without aligning it to the values of things that are really important to you, you run the risk of running into a situation where you might then need to leave that in another six months or a year or so. So I like to ground this process really strongly in who you are as a person and what matters to you. Is to inventory your skills. So figure out what do you have to offer that you want to take with you to that next goal or next location. And the reason that I have people 
do this is because sometimes we'll just go by what's on our resume and say, all right, here are all the things that I've done. Who else is going to find these values? But that might also include things that maybe you weren't as good at, or in some cases, might include things that you had to do but don't want to do again. <laughs> so I like to have this piece in place so you can start to think about where are the jobs or what are the opportunities that allow me to do the things that I am best at and most enjoy. Who needs it? And sometimes you have an idea, like if, for example, you were working in let's say marketing, and you wanted to take some of those skills and move them into journalism. So if you've been doing more marketing, heavy writing, and you wanted to do more reporting or more um, opinion type pieces, figuring out who needs the type of writing that you're doing. So that can start with an assessment of what's in that marketplace. That can start with getting an understanding of what publications exist and which ones you might want to work with. But that can also be a little bit broader. Maybe you're recognizing I need something different, but I don't necessarily know what that is yet. And that's a reality as well. So what I'm going to do now is show you a tool online and give you an example of how it works. Um, you can take down some notes, write down the links, so you can do this for yourself later. It's a little bit more challenging to do on a phone if it's not super mobile friendly or I have you do it along with me. Um, but I'll show you what it looks like. So within my time working on campuses, I also did uh, work in career counseling. And this tool is one I really like because it's got a massive compendium of all the different, different types of jobs you could possibly do. So the website that I'm going to direct you towards is ONET Online, O-N-E-T, online.org, slash skills. And what this site does is it lets you go through a number of different skills that industries will list. And you can go through and list the ones that apply to you across six different categories. Basic skills, complex problem solving, resource management, social skills, systems, and technical skills. So, so I'll show you how it works real quick by picking a couple different examples. So if I had Reading comprehension, speaking, writing, active listening, time management, instructing, social perceptiveness, systems analysis. So you can go through and pick the ones that align with what you wrote down, or go with ones that maybe didn't come to mind when you were writing them down, but as you see them, you think, that's something I can do. And once you click go, it gives you a massive list of all different sorts of industries you could possibly apply those skills to. And it does it in a sense of how many of your skills match, as well as what level of expertise you have to have to be successful in them. And the list is huge, and you don't necessarily have to go through all of them, but it gives you a lot of different options. And it's solidly in place, hard work for, we saw it, it was difficult. <laughs> Um, thinking about, again, going back to your skills, getting regular feedback about what you're good at, not just in your own terms, but from what other people who have worked with you or have spent time around you or who have an idea of what you've done, what are you good at and who can benefit from those things? So the who can benefit from those things is examining their utility. So thinking really deeply about where you want to go next and how the skills that you have and the strengths that you've identified align with what they're looking for. Assembling your crew, making sure that you have the relationships in place for people to be able to help you go through this. Having those people that you can say, I see you know this person that I've been wanting to talk with them. Can you set up a time for us to um, either meet over email, maybe get coffee, maybe there's somebody you know who does the job you want. Being able to spend some time with them, get an idea of what their path was and what you might need to be able to do similar work. Finding those people that can catch those typos on your resume or cover letter. I never see them, but someone else will probably see it because they didn't write it and aren't attached to it. So anybody in your ecosystem that can help move you forward, identifying who those people are, and then maybe each week reaching out to two or three of those people and say, I'm working on making this change. Can you help me? I would love it if you could do this thing. And once they know what that thing is, you make their job easy. 
And then once you identify some of those opportunities that you do want to move forward with, being able to figure out how to put it to paper, learning the language of that industry, and then committing to rewriting your resume and rethinking your cover letter in their language. So when it comes in alongside a number of other pieces of paper that all have the same thing, yours doesn't stand out in a way that looks like you don't understand where you're going. It stands out for the level of expertise that you have, the uniqueness that you can bring in, and the gaps in that industry that you might be able to fill from what you've been doing somewhere different. That has value, and as long as you're able to talk about it in a way that makes sense, you'll be able to get considered and start moving in directions that you might not have thought you could move in before. <coughs> so the biggest reason that I do this is to let people know you can do this. I spend a lot of time with people talking them through their transitions. And believe it or not, the biggest part of it isn't about getting them the skills that they need. And the biggest part of it isn't necessarily about rewriting their resume or cover letter, even though that part is a lot of work. The biggest part, most of the time, especially with women, especially with people of color, especially with women of color, is getting them to the place where they think they can do the thing that they want to do. You have the capacity to do this. And being able to get yourself to a place where you've believed that and can start to have it live in the documents that you put out and in the connections that you make is massive. Mm -hmm. And an hour and a half is not enough time for me to give that feeling to everybody. <laughs> and I understand that. So if you would like to follow up with me, my information is on the back. Um, what I usually do is I have two hour intensive calls and we can spend that two hours at any part of this process that you like. So if you come in and say, I hate cover letters, we can spend two hours working on one, building it out for the opportunity that you want. Or if you're looking for specific <coughs> resources on how to build, uh, build your expertise in a certain area, I'll spend two hours going through that with you. If it's an area where I have expertise, happy to share what I know. If you feel like you have a LinkedIn profile that's got 800 connections and you have no idea how to organize that into something that's helpful, we can spend two hours on that. Um, and I typically do that for $299. For this group, I will take $100 off of that. So get in touch. My contact information will be on, I want to say the next slide. Maybe it's on after. But yeah, so you can send me a tweet, you can email me. But please get in touch. I would love to keep this conversation going because, again, 90 minutes isn't enough to set you off on that right path. But you can email me. You can tweet at me. We can work together a little bit more. But I would love, love, love to help you move to the next step. Make that pivot to where you want to be next. So we've got a little bit of time for a question. Go ahead. Um, Cassandra Campbell, co-founder of Fresh Food Generation. We are a farm-to-plate food truck, cafe, and catering business. We are in our fifth year. So this is like the first year where I know that the phone's ringing and we're in business for good. <laughs> but it also brings a lot of challenges. Um, so we started with the intention of increasing access to healthy, affordable, cooked foods in low-income neighborhoods. Um, I am currently a Roxbury resident. I was raised in Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, looking for one word to describe those three neighborhoods. I didn't want to come up with something, but um, I spent time in Cambridge because I went to urban planning school there and realized I had a lot of access to quick, tasty food options when I was in Cambridge. When I moved back to Roxbury, I realized I was hopping in my car and traveling to other neighborhoods to get access to quick, good food. Um, and it wasn't a problem because like, one, I had the privilege of knowing where to get food. Two, I had a car. Um, but then I realized that there were people that I cared about who were really struggling with diet-related diseases um, that didn't have the same privilege. At that year, I watched my friend's dad pass away due to a diet-related illness. And so it really started to hit home for me that this was an issue worth working on. Um, and for the rest is history. I will pass the mic.
straightforward path through um, the educational system. I grew up on Long Island, went to a very large public school, and then went to a very small liberal arts college. And it was there that I learned to just uh, think and huh? Oh, Kenyon College. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I learned to think and to question, and I really learned to enjoy thinking with other people. Um, and then I went, I wasn't done asking questions, so I went to grad school, and apparently I wasn't done asking questions <laughs> either, and found myself uh, now teaching at Colby. I've always loved history, it's my first love. Um, I think it's very important uh, for people of color in particular to know that which we have very little access to know for all kinds of reasons. Um, I love, uh, my second love, is anthropology, um, and I was very interested in how people learn to live meaningful lives, um, how they navigate the everyday and the ordinary. So that's my intro. Hello, my name is Nicole Alcantara Bueno Carol Newman. It's a long <laughs> strategies and diversity consulting. Um, I am a wife, I am a sister, a daughter, um, and my most cherished one is probably a community builder. Um, and so my path actually was pretty traditional for a very long time. I, um, I'm from New York, I went Woo! to college. <laughs> College uh, Williams College out in Western Mass, um, another NESCAP school too, um, and I have been a sociology geek forever. So I was studying food anthropology before it was a thing because I thought it was fascinating how our roots actually contribute to what we end up eating and who we end up eating with and who's around our table. And so I've always kind of been driven by this community um, first aspect. And I imagine that's a lot for my parents because my parents were teachers um, growing up. And so that's what, one of the things they instilled in me. Um, and so I decided that the way I was going to, um, you know, push forward the injustices they saw as teachers was to become an attorney. And I knew that since I was about four years old. So uh, when I went to law school, it was nothing like I could have ever imagined. And I had worked in the law before then, um, and it wasn't fun, and it broke down my spirit in so many ways, except for some of the wonderful people um, I met there. Shout out to Shiloh Williams, who was, went to law school with me, and is one of the reasons I stayed sane and came today. Um, and, I left law school, I went on to practice corporate law um, at a large law firm here, and I felt every day, like even though I had been in predominantly white um, societies, cultures, classrooms, most of my life, uh, there was something about being in that environment that didn't let me show up. Yep. And every day I lost more and more of myself until I developed a neurological disorder. I literally couldn't walk one day. Um, and that changed the trajectory of my life. Um, it was scary, it's been a scary road. Um, and it's only over the past, I would say, year that I really have come into feeling like, oh no, I am a business owner and this is what I do and I'm proud of it and I'm okay with having shifted um, out of practicing corporate law because this feels good to me, um, and I'm happy to talk more later as we go on. But that's basically how I got here as an entrepreneur. I run a blog called Melon and Moxie, um, and I do my diversity consulting under Q Solutions, um, and I'm happy to talk about that more. Can you see me? Because I'm very small. <laughs> Uh, so I grew up in Colombia, very traditional family. 
not really very interesting in how uh, I'm from Bogota. I'm from Bogota, yes. Yeah. So I studied engineering. <laughs> and um, that was my life until I met my husband. And one day he decided, like, let's go uh, overseas and get our master's degree. And I thought he was joking because he jokes a lot. <laughs> and it turned out he was very serious. So um, we picked Spain because we didn't know English. So we said, let's go to Spain. Uh, but the problem that we loved was in English, was the international MBA. <laughs> so we decided to, uh, at the time his sister was living in, in New York City, so we moved to New York City to learn English, and then moved to Spain. But New York City, let me tell you, is not the best city to learn English. <laughs> Product that 
that there is a market for, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how, and I started it as a side gig, still working in engineering. And a year ago, uh, the company was growing and I decided what's my purpose? Should I continue working in big corporations now in construction or should I just jump? Mm -hmm. Without the financial stability that I could have as, a, you know, as an engineer. <coughs> But I will talk later about the, the I will talk later about the support system. But I have an amazing support system, and I decided to jump, and that's where we are now. We're in over seventy different boutiques in uh, retailers in throughout the country, and uh, we are growing. I think better my people like to sit. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, so. Hi, I'm Jay Wow. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So I'm a shaman. Um, I'm also a 24 person multiple, which means that I have 24 souls in my body that tell me things. I'm stark raving nuts. And I have leveraged that and being autistic, which I am, I've leveraged that into two articles in Forbes. I am um, I'm coming off of being a, uh, an international award-winning senior technical writer for the Pentagon and for some of the top tech companies in the country, in fact, in the world, and two of them hired me as a multiple and hired my autistic personality to do work for them. So you want to talk about an alternative? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then Spirit buys me a quarter million dollars a year. I'm 59. I know y'all are 59. Um, I'm 59, so I didn't used to just be the only egg spot. I was the only thing, um, female or black, wherever I was, every single time for 35 years. And gay, and pagan, and crazy. I mean, I just like I got the intersectional thing coming. <laughs>1971 when I handled my first gang rape survivor, mm -hmm. I'm, I've been on call for the planet for 48 years. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, you do not need to leave where you are to make a difference. Because if you think about it, everything that everybody said here, I want to make a difference. You can make a difference every day. Mm -hmm. You do not need to leave your career or help you teach us your money mm -hmm. to make a difference. Because the world wants, doesn't know that it wants us wealthy. If I'm wealthy, the world gets better. I say that in rooms full of millionaires and they believe me, because it's true. I started stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's hard to start stuff when you don't have a network supporting you and you don't have money to do stuff. Right? Oh, and by the way, I, I, y'all are so polite. I'm not. When I ask you something, I want to hear something back. Y'all are going to Google and, and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can I hear that everybody understands what I'm saying? Can you just say yes? Yes. 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 Okay. My introduction of myself is I'm everything that the world hates. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm fat, I'm black, I'm female, I'm mm -hmm. gay, I'm crazy, and I'm pagan. Right? And yet here I am leading the global culture of inclusion and empowerment, about to go talk to five New York Times best-selling authors because they want to write books with me. I've got two Forbes articles where they interviewed me. My first article was three times longer than Forbes allows, and they included all my extras. I'm trying very hard not to cuss today. Okay. <laughs> Because I'm on a mission. And what I hope you guys walk away with today is that your mission is not contingent upon your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Your mission is contingent upon your care, mm -hmm. wherever you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And these wonderful women here are going to talk about how they stood up in their power and their, their mission. Power being defined as the ability to influence that which is not our business. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, and do that to them too, even though I'm just asking for it. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> if you keep that in mind as you listen to each of us, don't think, oh, wow, no, one day, maybe if I eat a field of broccoli, I might be able to do something like that. Like, don't think like that. Mm -hmm. Think like right here, right now, when I leave here today, mm -hmm. I'm going to go home and think about where do I get to make a difference? Mm -hmm. Where can I start making a little difference? Because remember, please, you want to sit down. Appalachians are started by covenants with their attitude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Pebbles with an attitude. I just made that one up. Because okay. <laughs> here's the other one. For those of you who are thinking, oh, I'm too damaged, I'm too broken. Okay, I've eaten two incurable wounds. I'm the only living per I'm the only person in medical history to eat one. And there's this saying about um, the, we call them Jay Wally. <laughs> I shall be free when the uh, Let's see. I shall be free when the when the beauty of the of my no I gotta, I gotta get this right. I shall be free when the pull of the circumstances is greater than the security of my armor. Don't let your safety stop you from making a difference. You were born to make. Right. Probably never going to change, but I can look at that bit of me 
that loves adrenaline. I can look at that bit of me that wanted to practice law and say what that bit wanted to do was advocate. What that bit wanted to do was give people a platform for speaking their stories and standing in their truths, right? And so I had to really analyze the different parts and where I was feeling and what I was feeling. I, it came down to me saying, I feel fractured in my life, in my choices, in my job, and I know there are other people who feel this too, and I want to help fix that. And that, to me, is where I looped in advocacy. I looped in, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've helped counsel people and done mediations and things just over topics that corporations won't think matter, right? And bringing in those things and letting people actually stand in their truths mm -hmm. makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I came to well, my true purpose being to really help others stand in their truth and use, um, give them a boost to use my privileges, um, those degrees and letters behind my name um, to help lift other people up who should be in this seat, but aren't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to say very, something very quickly. I think I am still finding my purpose. Um, I, uh, I initially thought like being in jewelry was very like shallow, like, like <laughs> this is not important in life. Nobody really needs jewelry to live. That's how I saw it at the beginning. But then when I found a way of how I can support the less privileged ones. Um, that's when it kind of made me a, a better sense of how I could help. Uh, but I say that I'm still looking or finding the purpose because as an entrepreneur, I always have like all these ideas, how can I fix this problem? How can I fix this problem? And, you know, you cannot fix all the problems of the world. But what I have found that it is like a common denominator of all those problems that I'm always thinking of is how I can help the less privileged ones. And I'm gonna give you an example. Like right now I am developing, we are developing a app in construction actually uh, to help minority owned and women owned businesses get better visibility to general contractors and construction owners. So I was like, how come, like I'm thinking about jewelry and then technology and mm -hmm. so what is the common denominator is helping those less uh, privileged uh, in a way. But I feel like every day I'm still working towards uh, creating something bigger and better for others. In martial arts, if you want to break a board, if you hit the board, you will break your hand. If you want to break the board, you have to aim for beyond the board and go through the board, right? If you shoot for the stars and you get the moon, it's still a miracle. <laughs> purpose, for me, I have known my purpose. The kids in my neighborhood started trying to stone me, to not trying to stone me, stone me, to try and kill me when I was seven. They started trying to throw me under moving cars by the time I was eight. I've lost count of how many times people have tried to kill me or eventually me trying to kill myself. Purpose is a bigger thing than about your immediate tactics, sweet ones. It's about a thing that's based in your core values that pulls you forward when your good day is crawling on your knees to get to the bathroom and get back to your bed, and that's your only activity for the day. It will pull you out of your hospital bed when you're semi-paralyzed to try and get to help people because you're too drugged to know that you can't do that. Purpose is based in your core values. And then you build from there for the larger thing that you want to do. That's what I find, that's what I teach. My purpose is to love everybody on the planet into their greatness. Remember that shooting stars, you get the moon thing, who's complaining? Right, it's still magic. If I only get four billion of you, I'm good with that. 
That will pull me forward in anything. It doesn't matter if I'm doing corporate work. It doesn't matter if I'm doing philanthropic work. It does not matter if I'm doing shamanic work. One way or another, my purpose has been the same since 1971 with that first gang rape survivor. I was 11 and she was 18, and I looked up at her, and I'm a genius. I looked up at her, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm a kid. I don't see any adults anywhere, so I'm going to talk you through this. And what I talked her through before Roe versus Wade, before rape kits and everything, is exactly what I would say today at 11, because I made it up. Because I decided when I was 11, I had a phrase, and this is my purpose. No one left on the ground. No one left in the dark. Mm -hmm. No one left in the cold. Mm -hmm. No one left behind. Mm -hmm. Not on my watch. Mm -hmm. I've been saying that every day of my life since 1971 when I was 11 years old. I have lived that. If you look at my resume, you look at that Forbes article, that is all I have done 24-7 for 48 years. Your purpose, hopefully, will feed through Every single thing you do, how I treat my partner 28 years is made out of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> how I treat my parents, my new friends, the tribe that is rising up around me on Planet J. Well, I got my own planet. I just have to Enjoy Planet J. Well, anytime. We're a practice, we're a practice yard for being a good human being, all right? Come back out here and do whatever mess you got to do. So I found my purpose early and big enough for it to contribute to my entire life. And I didn't wait. If I can do it at 11, y'all can do it now. Most of you are older than 11, right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait. Don't wait. Find that purpose. Run that puppy to the ground. Get the thing done. And you can do it with the person in the cubicle next to you. Your purpose is something that lets you make a difference 24-7. If your purpose is not your 24-7 thing, if you've got a tactic, you don't have a purpose. You've got a, you've got a reason, you don't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know you've got a purpose when you dog sick and you standing up and getting dressed and your partner's just sitting on you going, girl, you've got the police in there. <laughs> okay, so don't wonder whether or not you have a purpose. You'll know it when it bites you in the face. All right, and then follow that. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing people sitting next to you, whether you know them well or not. They are your tribe, all right? And I think part of why I started Melanin and Moxie was because Boston felt so lonely to me. And one of the things that no one tells you is that when you get off that, you know, that track, right? You spend, you go to school, you do all the things, and you're always in line with other people mm -hmm. who are doing those same things. So even when you feel lonely then, you're like, oh, I have my small little crew, right? But once you step off that pathway, right? My friends have jobs, they have lives, some of them have children. I don't get to see them. I'll be lucky if they get out of work before like 11 or midnight, oh, yeah. right? Like, so you start saying, well, Where's my tribe now? I know they exist. I know they're a phone call away, but who can understand what I'm going through? Who can I say, I have no idea what I'm doing, and I have this dream or this idea, but it sounds batshit crazy, and I, what do I do with it, right? And or I don't have the capital that other people have, and I know this is a good idea, but what do I do? And I've been really, really fortunate. You know, my husband just moved down from New York about six months ago. Um, yeah, we've been bouncing between cities. I think this is the longest we've lived in the same place outside of college. Um, and he has always been my rock. My friends, I mentioned Shaloe before, my sister, they have been my rocks, and your rocks will change, right? And they, it might not be the same person. It may, you know, 
some of the people, I go to different people for different things. Yeah. And my sister and my husband are two of the only people, I wouldn't even, not even my parents, that when I have those days where I can't walk or I can't feel part of my body, um, or I am in agonizing pain, and they're the only two I let see it, right? I don't want anyone to see it. I won't let anyone help me to the bathroom or help feed me except them too. And that doesn't diminish any of the rest of my village, right? It just says I have different people for different things. And so when I wanted to start my business, I found a business coach that re resonated with me. And she's been on this journey from me saying, look, I have this idea, it's actually like three or four different companies, but I want to distill it to at least two or three. And um, I know I'm supposed to be doing this, and I think I want to practice law too still, but I don't know. And she's been on this journey. <laughs> you can't hold me down. But, um, but yeah, and I think that's where you just kind of keep cultivating your village. You have the people. Be willing to, it is really scary to be vulnerable. But golly, as women of color, we need to do it. Yes. Like, there's no other way around it. Like, I promise you, there is someone in this room who will resonate with something you say, who will be like, thank you for saying that. And once you realize that, right, and this is part of what I do in the Melanin and Moxie Facebook community, I ask, what are you celebrating? What are you afraid of? What are you going toward? How can we support you? Because I think once we start opening up and having those conversations, mm -hmm. and amazing things happen. Mm -hmm. People, I have great friends across this country, across the world, who I've never met in person. Mm -hmm. And the internet is an amazing thing. I know I'm old when I say this, but I say this every day. It's an amazing thing that I can have these relationships. People who check in on me, how are you feeling today, right? I've never met you, but like my logo, like my is from someone who I've been really close friends with. When I jumped into this entrepreneurial entrepreneurial journey, she was like, "Girl, I've been there too, and I have two kids and two dogs. Like, let me help you. How can I help?" And oh, it's not strange to feel this way. And please, none of us know what we're doing. And yes. uh, you know, like those are the people you need. Those are the people you love hard, and you just keep loving them when they're quiet. And they're not, um, and I think that's kind of how you just keep cultivating your village. Mm -hmm. Also, add to um, what everyone has said, my village with my tribe mm -hmm. um, includes the ancestors. So uh, I'm very aware, uh, in particular, of all the women that I will never know that survived God knows what to get me to where I am. And I think about that a lot uh, when I write, I write books um, as well. And I think about that, and I think about them as sort of imagined readers. And I just think it's important um, to recognize yeah. the power uh, that is, I never like to think of ancestors behind us, but you get it, behind us. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> For me, <laughs> the difference between a community or a congregation or whatever you want to say and a tribe is the intimacy. How willing are you to be vulnerable? How willing are you to show your stuff? Now, I had to learn with 30 years of 24-7 pain, the condition that I had, 24-7 pain for 30 years of someone basically felt like someone was raping me with a white hot surrey at night and trust me, you cannot sleep through that. I didn't sleep for 22 years. The pain that I was in is literally 10 times worse than labor. Any of you have babies, that's bad. And that was 24 seven, it never stopped. And I did the thing with Pentagon and all the tech companies and all of that. I had twice the medication that they give people who are dying from cancer in a matter of weeks. And I took that every week for five years and a tribe prayed for, my tribe prayed for my liver. It is impossible mm -hmm. to take the amount of Percocet that I took and have a healthy liver after yeah. six weeks. Yeah. Oh, okay, here's, 
you could, you know, when you're dying of cancer, you get a $25 straight to Percocet in your last six weeks because in five weeks, it's going to in your last five weeks, in six weeks, it's going to eat your liver. Mm -hmm. Okay? I was on 40 double straight to Percocet a week for five years, and I have a healthy liver because my tribe paid for my liver. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by intimacy and power. Mm -hmm. Your tribe, you'll find them, and they will find you. You. But here's the thing. You don't know, like everybody's putting all those sad emojis and stuff up where all this mess is happening. I'm always putting up an angry emoji. People think I'm mad. Like, Sad's gonna keep you on the couch. Angry's gonna get you out your house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Okay. okay. So I'm just putting up a, a TikTok emoji. <laughs> <laughs> My tribe. We talk about the pain you're in and the shaming of being a powerful woman uh -huh. with some measure of privilege who feels broken and so you can't have anybody else see you where you are. I didn't let people see me screaming yeah. until I didn't have any voice left in the bathroom. Uh -huh. Okay, and then I learned something magnificent and I will probably cry when I say this. When people love you and they believe in you, they don't care about your vulnerability. They don't care about your ugly pain. They care about whether or not they can be there for you and hold you long enough to stay on the planet and stand back up. Mm -hmm. That's all they care about. Mm -hmm. Let them please mm -hmm. love you. That's the thing we're not taught. That's the thing right. Taylor Swift's not teaching. That's the thing mm -hmm. that no. all these other people are not teaching no. about love. Mm -hmm. Right? Not Love's not that thing where it's all rainbows and unicorns right. and stuff. And trust me, I believe in rainbows and unicorns at the same time. That's not the thing. The thing is when it's ugly and dirty and terrible Come and on. you are broken and you are screaming. When it's 4.30 in the morning and I've got a signal bang on the wall and my partner has to wake up and hold me while I'm sitting on the toilet screaming because I want to die. That's when your tribe shows up for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can't show up for you if you're busy being strong all the time. <laughs> Stop that, please, because it gives you high blood pressure. <laughs> you you know, I'm an old fat lady, right? Don't, like, like, don't let representing an entire race to the entire planet give you high blood pressure and diabetes and a whole bunch of other mess. That makes sense? Yes. yes. Better, please. Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so that's the, that's the tribe piece. Please mm -hmm. let your tribe choose you as you mm -hmm. choose them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jay.